this is how you cross over from Israel to Gaza. And right now we're in no man's land. Prime Minister, do you now regret when once asked what your favourite joke was, you replied Nick Clegg? And Deputy Prime Minister, what do you think of that? Mr Trump, why should you be president? What makes you fit for the role? Is it just one big ego trip? Thank you very much. People aren't sure they can trust what you say. You say what? things and then it turns out that they're not quite what you say. I'm Andy Bell and I've been a journalist for over 30 years, reporting for the BBC, Sky and ITN in the UK and around the world. In How Did We Get Here? I hope to provide the background and context to help understand a story in the news better. This week, the coronavirus. Where did it come from? How dangerous is it? And is it a warning for the future? I've been talking to Dr Natalie McDermott, clinical lecturer in infectious paediatric diseases, a specialist in researching outbreaks of this kind. We spoke in her office across the road from St Thomas Hospital in London. Dr Natalie McDermott, thank you for finding time, especially at this time when there's a lot to be looking into and a lot of research to be done and a lot of data to be collected and a lot of work to be carried out. Thanks for finding your time to talk to us for uh, the podcast, How Did We Get Here? So, how did we get here? Let's begin with coronavirus. Um, what is different special about this outbreak that makes you know that is making the news around the world um so i think that this outbreak is slightly different um because there is ongoing human to human transmission in china which is obviously a, a country with a very high population density and also a country that lots of people visit and also people from china travel a lot so the risk of it being spread outside of china as we've seen is is high uh, and the risk within China itself uh, is quite high for this disease to continue spreading. Now, unlike other uh, epidemic diseases that we've seen like Ebola, this is uh, a disease that can be spread through the air. So when people cough and sneeze and droplets come out, if someone were to inhale them, then they can become infected. So that means you don't necessarily have to have direct physical contact with someone to become infected. And we also think that you can become, you can be infectious when you're in the incubation period of the virus. So that's, Before you're showing any, th any yeah. symptoms. So right? you've been infected, but you haven't shown any symptoms yet. So you don't necessarily know you're unwell, mm -hmm. uh, but you could spread it to other people. Mm -hmm. So that just makes it a lot harder to contain mm -hmm. because you're asking people who don't necessarily know they've had contact with someone to maybe isolate themselves at home to protect others. Uh, and that's very hard to know who, who's been infected and who hasn't. Okay, so it's nasty and it's very infectious. Is it, it's new, and, and if it's new, where has it come from? Yeah, it is a new virus. So it's from a family of viruses called coronaviruses. Um, we're still waiting for this one to be specifically named, um, but it has, potentially come from bats. I think that's where the bats. evidence is suggesting at the moment. Yep. How does that get into the kind of human bloodstream, <laughs> if I can put it like that? So uh, it can do it in two ways, either direct contact with bats. So if people hunt bats or if they uh, might visit caves where there are bats present and uh, the bats may not become ill with it, but they can keep the virus in their bodies and then it can come out of their bodies when they, you know, in their excrement. Mm. So if you went into a cave that was full of bat excrement, potentially you could become infected or if you handled a sick, well, an infected bat, but also other animals might be able to contract it from bats. Because okay. I was talking about snakes at one point in the market in Wuhan. Have you heard of that connection? Uh, so I heard snakes mentioned. It's it's very unusual. There aren't that many reptiles, as far as I'm aware, that are known to carry coronaviruses. It tends to be more mammals that we know about. And it's also a bit more difficult for a virus to do what we call a species hop mm -hmm. when you're talking from one very different species to another. So if it's mammal to mammal, the, the difference in the virus or the mutation in the virus could be relatively small, potentially. But we have to remember that reptiles are cold-blooded animals. So for a virus to hop from a cold-blooded animal to a warm-blooded animal potentially requires a more significant mutation. It's certainly not impossible, um, but I think that the evidence we have now is more suggestive that it has somehow come from bats and whether someone had a contact with a bat or whether they had contact with another mammal that had been infected from a bat uh, is a possibility. And this could have come literally from one person having that contact. Is that possible? 
Uh, yes, that's possible. It could come from one or it could come from a cluster of people that had contact in the same location. Mm -hmm. So there's questions of what animals might have been being sold in the seafood market in Wuhan. Mm -hmm. um, it's unclear what wild animals. It was largely supposed to be a seafood market, but it is known that other mm -hmm. animals were being sold at that time. Mm -hmm. um, I've also been informed that bats are a delicacy in Wuhan. Okay. Uh, in terms of on special occasions, people might eat bat. So maybe no longer. <laughs> Let's put it that way. <laughs> well, y you would hope, but I've had conversations with people in West Africa about not eating monkey meat after the Ebola epidemic, and I have friends who've informed me that they eat monkey meat because it tastes really good. Okay. All right. Um, and when did it really start? If we can remember when people first became aware that something extraordinary was happening in Wuhan and how quickly therefore has it you know, spread? So I think we first became aware of it or there were murmurings of it towards the end of December uh, and then I think the first sort of unknown pneumonia cases were declared around the 31st of December. So it's incredibly quick and has spread so fast. I mean is that, that's presumably part of the, the worry about it. That is part of the worry. I think it had probably been circulating for a little bit before we knew about it, but obviously we hadn't identified the virus yet specifically. Uh, so it, sometimes it's very hard to draw that conclusion prospectively, like retrospectively, you can look back and say, oh, those were probably all cases of this as well. But because we didn't know the virus, we had clusters of pneumonia cases who were simply testing negative for any of the known viruses or bacteria. Mm -hmm. and that can happen. So they weren't necessarily saying, ah, this is the this is this new thing. They were just going, we don't know necessarily what this is. Yes, okay. and it's only as those clusters built mm -hmm. that people started to be a bit more suspicious and, mm -hmm. and that. And uh, being brutal about it, I mean, as we speak, there are about 500 people who've died, which is obviously a lot. But a lot of people die from a lot of diseases. I mean, is it, are we, is it right that we are becoming so concerned and the World Health Organization is so concerned? You know, on the face of it, is it big enough to justify you know, the, 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 the global concern? So I think the global concern has more to do with how uh, quickly it is and easily it's being transmitted rather than the severity of the disease it causes. Uh, so, so far we, we're under the impression that the people who get the most severe disease are people in the older age groups or those who already have medical problems or problems with their immune system that mean they can't fight the virus very well. That means that probably the majority of people get a nasty flu-like illness from it or some people may even get a very mild kind of cold or nasty cold but uh, not uh, ne never needing hospital admission or becoming too unwell. The problem is that as you have increasing numbers, um, obviously then you're more likely to have increasing numbers of older people and your deaths will go up. The mortality rate from this virus at the moment looks to be around 2%. Having said that, we're probably missing a big chunk of the milder infections not seeking hospital treatment, so actually it might be lower than that. Now compared with SARS, the mortality rate from SARS was around 10%. We compare it to Ebola, Ebola has a mortality rate of between 50 and 60%. So obviously this is far lower, but we have to bear in mind that the containment measures used to deal with tens of thousands of cases can overwhelm a health system. So trying to isolate all these people um, is meaning that other medical problems are not going to be addressed optimally. So for instance, if you were in Wuhan at the moment, and you had a heart attack, you're gonna find it very hard to get medical treatment because the system is completely overwhelmed with identifying cases of coronavirus, managing the severe cases, isolating the not so severe cases, and also you run the risk of having to go into hospital where you could be exposed to someone with coronavirus. So it's the long-term impact that that could have. Okay, it's like, and so when the World, I mean, the World Health Organization has said they're very worried about it getting a real hold in less developed, less organised countries than China, and then it could be even more dangerous. Yes, so in low income nations, we run the risk that cases won't be identified particularly quickly, by which point you've already got onward spread in that country before you ever even knew there was one case there. Um, and we're also talking about a population that has a much weaker, uh, or a country that has a much weaker health infrastructure, 
They don't necessarily have the ability to isolate people uh, promptly. Uh, they don't have ventilators to support people if they're particularly unwell. And we're also talking about a population whose general health might not be as robust because they may suffer from malnutrition. They may have underlying medical problems that they don't know about that aren't very well managed. Uh, so many factors that come in in a low income nation that could make it a, a significant problem there. Okay. What, what do you make of the way China has, has dealt with this so far, and maybe in comparison to previous outbreaks like SARS? So I think China dealt with it pretty well. Uh, I think there's some questions about perhaps the openness about the cases in December time and perhaps uh, the conclusion that there was person to person spread uh, because for at least the first couple of weeks we were being told it was all just people directly related to the seafood market. Some of the data now being published suggests that wasn't the case necessarily and uh, potentially if we'd known about person to person spread a bit sooner uh, implementation and containment measures may have come in a bit sooner and we might not have had spread certainly to as many Chinese cities uh, as, as we have where some of those are growing in significant numbers as we speak. Okay and what about the UK response so people coming out being flown out um, the people who are flown out on specific flights chartered from Wuhan are going into 14-day quarantine but there are lots of people who are flying back on the, any old flight from other cities in China, shouldn't they be going into quarantine as well? Because they're not. So I think the difference is, uh, is based on making a risk assessment. And the risk assessment for Wuhan is high because there's so many cases. I, I mean, last figures I looked at, between 16 and 17,000 cases in that city. And those are the ones we're identifying. So there may be a lot of people with milder uh, illness and people aren't identifying those. So the risk if you lived in Wuhan, even if you had pretty much isolated yourself in your apartment for the last couple of weeks, uh, is a lot higher than if, say, you're living in Beijing, where there may be a few hundred cases. Mm. So I, I think the understanding by the government is that anyone coming out of Wuhan directly should be isolated for 14 days because there's a much higher risk they could have been exposed. Those coming out of China by themselves are being asked to self-isolate at home for that 14-day incubation period, so to see if they develop symptoms and to inform public health officials that they are in the UK so that they can make contact with them. And what are the symptoms that people should watch out for? Um, the symptoms that people should watch out for are essentially a fever, uh, a sore throat, a dry cough, uh, the general symptoms you might expect when you're coming down with a cold Which or a flu. Which at this time of year <laughs> is, quite is a problem. Likely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh. Um, I think the main issue is have you come from an affected region and or have you had contact with someone you know has then since been diagnosed with the virus? And in that case, you should just self isolate at home and contact Public Health England or the public health authorities in the country that you're in to inform them of that situation. They can then make a decision based on the information they collect from that person as to what the risk is, whether they need to be tested, and they can also monitor them for symptoms. Is Britain well set up to deal with this sort of thing? Yes, Britain is well set up to deal with this situation. Obviously, to deal with tens of thousands of cases is a challenge for any health system. Uh, but to deal with a handful of cases, that is most definitely not a problem. And we have a really robust public health service who will identify promptly and isolate people and monitor them and then follow up any contacts that they have. So the risk of it spreading in the UK is really unlikely. But we do have the facilities in our NHS to scale up if we need to, if there were to be a small cluster of cases or an outbreak in the UK. I mean, people might find that surprising because obviously we hear a lot about how there's so limited capacity in the NHS and at this time of year there's more demands on it but you would say that if needs be it can be done? Yes there is yes there's limited capacity and yes we are overwhelmed in the winter time by people who are unwell with flu-like illnesses and other illnesses what will be implemented though will be an emergency plan rather than just the standard plan for which we do have scale-up mechanisms but it may mean that other services are compromised. So, have we ever had to do this before? Uh, probably right. not on a large scale. We have had cases of infections that have come back that have had to be isolated. But because we have such a robust health service, we're generally speaking uh, able to contain 
uh, any imported cases. Mm. Having said that, with swine flu in 2009, H1N1, we did have uh, quite a large number of cases in the UK. It didn't turn out to be as big a concern, I think, as we were anticipating, but it still affected large numbers of people. I mean, I haven't asked you about a vaccine. I mean, are we anywhere near a vaccine for this coronavirus? So, well, from what I understand, there are uh, three groups specifically who've been funded and they all have different types of platforms that they can use. And now that we have the genetic information for the virus and we can understand its structure a bit better, um, the availability of a vaccine will probably be fairly prompt. However, it has to go through safety testing first, and that will always take several months to do. And then it really has to go through efficacy testing. But arguably, if it's known to be safe, it could be rolled out in an epidemic situation. OK, but normally it would be several months. As a minimum. OK. Um, and in the absence of a, of a, um, of a vaccine, um, what is the treatment for somebody who has coronavirus? At the moment, there are no specific treatments for coronaviruses. There are some news reports that you'll hear of uh, individuals being treated with certain antiviral drugs uh, that are used in other viruses uh, that may have shown effect. But at the moment, we've only seen a few cases where people are suggesting it could be beneficial. And we can't really use that as good information that it is definitely beneficial. Uh, so otherwise, what would be, when the, 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 for instance, the two cases in, in the UK, how would they be being treated? Would they just be given lots of antibiotics, liquids? What, what, how would it work? Yeah, so they'll be given really good supportive care. So if they're not able to eat and drink properly, they'll be given intravenous fluids. If they're struggling with their breathing, they'll receive oxygen or some kind of breathing support. If they're thought to have a bacterial infection as well, they might then receive antibiotics, but we wouldn't use for, them routinely for a viral infection. Because antibiotics don't work with viruses. Yeah, yeah. I should have known that. Well, <laughs> but we do have antiviral drugs that, uh, yes, we don't know that they work for coronaviruses definitively, but certainly if you had someone who was very unwell and who was deteriorating, uh, you might choose to use them in the, uh, under a kind of a clinical trial setting to see, did, do they benefit the person? Now, it always feels to me that the back of our minds on this sort of thing is, you know, we've all seen the movies, we all, you know, the flu outbreak at the end of World War One, that kind of thing. Are we kind of waiting for something like that? I think that the world is always preparing for something like that. So um, within the WHO and uh, sort of global public health movements, uh, there is always the talk about disease X. So that's the unknown disease that could cause a potential pandemic with very high mortality and very easy spread. We can get on top of any epidemic, but the most important thing is public engagement and people being willing. Because if people aren't willing, then we will struggle to contain it. But if people are willing to self-isolate, if people are willing to contact Public Health England and say, I think I've had contact with someone, then we will contain it very quickly. I mean, do you think we always have to be prepared, though, and be constantly looking into these sorts of outbreaks to be ready in case there's something more dangerous? Yes, I think we always need to be prepared. And I, I think we learned a lot from the uh, Ebola epidemic in West Africa because actually we weren't prepared for the scale up it required. And there, a lot has been learned since then. There's a lot more cooperation on the international front between scientists and between the World Health Organization and different research groups. And um, there is work that is being funded by a lot of big funders, even in advance to study viruses and bacteria in different animal populations to understand what might do a species hop and what do we need to be prepared for in the future. Well, Dr Natalie McDermott, thank you very much for talking to us for How Did We Get Here? Let's hope that by the time a lot of people are listening to this, we may be able to see the end of uh, the coronavirus uh, outbreak. That was Dr Natalie McDermott. If you have thoughts on this podcast or ideas for any more, I'm on Twitter at @andybell 5 news and email at andy.bell at itn.co.uk. Thanks for listening to this edition of How Did We Get Here? There'll be another one along soon.